Okay, today is uh, May 27th of 2014. We're still continuing our studies on uh, the legacy of the development of postmodern thought. And from Levinas, we received the tip that uh, he greatly admired Martin Buber and uh, was especially indebted to his work, I and Thou, which was written in 1923. So we're looking at a work that is really about 40 years prior to the emergence of phenomenology which uh, upon which uh, postmodern thought is based. And so we've really got uh, a figure here who is really prophetically prior to the movement of uh, phenomenology in the 1960s. He was about 10 years prior to uh, Husserl and his work on phenomenology, so he is uh, even prior to Husserl's book also. So he's quite a bit ahead of his time, but what he does is speak for existentialism, but saying that we also have to say that we also have to say that uh, he speaks for an existentialism in dialogue, or an, an existentialism in relation, and existen existentialism in relation is the definition of phenomenology. That's the perfect definition. It's existentialism in the relationship of dialogue. And so, even though it is technically called a philosophy of existentialism, it is a phenomenology. It is uh, presented uh, by Buber in a pre precise phenom phenomenology order. He begins with uh, the unconscious and the work of the psyche. He then passes through the work of dialogue, which is essential for his position, obviously. It is a uh, existentialism of relation and dialogue. So the conversation threshold, the uh, what Aristotle called the de Kunta threshold is essential to his position and he gives that a lot of attention. He's going to uh, actually call that the realm of relation and then after the psyche passes through this uh, realm of relation it will move on to the cogito and the work of actually uh, articulating the posited sacrifices, he would say metaphorically, because all of his work is uh, situated within the Jewish metaphor. So it is a presentation of existentialism per Jewish metaphor to be conceptualized as a phenomenology. And he will introduce terms uh, like his most fundamental term, which is going to be the uh, the manna given by God to Israel in the wilderness and the wanderings within its exile. And this manna is his metaphorical symbol for the Logos. And so the Logos is, uh, of course, central to the driving force of his entire system. And he even gives that an Israeli metaphor as part of the uh, exile of uh, Israel within, of course, understood within its uh, covenant relationship. So everything is, presumes a relationship of covenant, but it is going to be a phenomenology that takes up uh, the Judaic faith, the Judaic metaphor of exile, and the Judaic metaphor of manna. In a way, he's articulating this uh, movement of the Logos. In a sense, that is, that's what he's doing based on the level of subjectivity. He is uh, showing the influence of the Logos in its emergence. So we begin by taking a look at the uh, unconscious or the realm of the psyche. And for uh, Buber, this is the I-it relationship where the individual self is more concerned with uh, possession of facts and uh, and uh, the taking of the it of reality, the uh, non-personal, non-involved, non-relational aspect. And uh, this is counter to what the truth is, 
because according to Buber, even at this level, it's like you should acknowledge that the self is never non-relational. The IU is initiated even at the sensate level, according to Buber, at uh, the units of meaning that uh, are presented in a situation can only be grasped if we grasp them beyond this idea of predicates or the idea of uh, looking at the units of meaning as its. And so we have to go uh, beyond the, the limit of uh, treating the external situation as object or predicate only. It's more than object, it's more than predicate. And so uh, we have to go beyond that in a relational stance or the art of standing in as we talk about. And by taking up this uh, relational stance, we're trying to uh, perceive beyond the limit of object and possession, then uh, the psyche can actually enter into the prelinguistic perceiving of the units of meaning, which are, of course, going to be generalizations, not universal truth, but generalizations where we actually form the units of meaning within a situation, but they are units of meaning that are grouped according to generalized association. So it's going to be generalized associations forming units of meaning. But once we take that stance of uh, standing in beyond the idea of possession and the idea of object, then we actually reach that generic concept of grace. And that becomes the true motivational base at the sensate level that Buber thinks needs to be emphasized is that uh, very initial stance of the generic concept of grace and the units of meaning are acquired in this act of grave grace as uh, being a perception by the self that is uh, interpreted subjectively as gift. So it is a, a sensate existence that is appropriated prayerfully or meditatively within the atmosphere of an understood grace and we acquire the prayerful units of meaning. We acquire the units of meaning that are perceived through this meditative stance of a relational point of view. But that is at the sensate level. It still is at the level of the uh, psyche and not uh, the cogito that is thinking. It's still more of the feeling level and more of a, the intuitive level, but it is an intuition that still operates, according to Buber, within spirit. So it's an intuition that is a, coupled with prayerful meditation. So prayerful meditation, meditation plus intuition will grasp the units of meaning in a situation that take the situation beyond its sensate meaning and uh, start moving it toward a directional sense, but only at first through very a generalized understanding of associations. So the two metaphors that uh, Buber would use here are the uh, metaphor of the uh, relation of exile, the self being exiled, but under the conditions of grace, so the relation of exile, under the conditions of covenant, and the relation of meaning, symbolized by the pillar of fire, that was a, a sign of direction given to the exiled Israel. And so that we get our sign of direction in these prayerful units of meaning that are the generalizations formed through association. And so there is a, a Pasukamai prayerful perceiving of the units of meaning Within the condition of charis or grace, it is motivated and mediated by this uh, relation of grace and covenant as a first understanding. We want to move beyond just the mere innate understanding of grace and beyond the intuitive perception of the units of meaning. But we can only do that if we enter into a true relational dialogue and this is where Buber wants to talk about his middle term. And the middle term always gets the greatest exposition. So the heart of his system is going to be this next step of dialogue. Now for the Judaic faith, 
any idea of the discussion of dialogue or any relation of the word talks about the uh, Ark of the Covenant symbolically that contained the oracles of the living God. It was it housed the word of divinity, the word of the infinite, the word of spirit. The oracles were enclosed within the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant is the symbolic or the metaphorical designation for this realm of relation. And uh, Buber gives us a triad of relation here. And first of all, uh, one, the psyche's life with sensate nature is below language. It is a uh, deals with percepts rather than concepts. Self adopts a grace to override the gnosis of possession. And units of meaning are grace thought pictures. Now, number two in the triad is the psyche's life with other selves as a transition to cogito, which we are in at this stage. That takes, it takes place as a relation within language. The IU is posited. Linear time is replaced by prayer and meditation, which are eschatological in nations, uh, nature. Eschatological time takes over linear time. And causal space is replaced by sacrifice. <clears throat> or what uh, Buber says is a symbol of the altar, a willingness to suffer for other selves, which is uh, the foundation for the IU, uh, being related to other selves at this conversation threshold. So it is a dialogue that takes place in a firmament of prayer and sacrifice, according to Buber. It establishes the sacred relation in dialogue. So a very important place. Like I said, the middle term is always the most significant term, as it is here. Now, the third part of his triad is uh, the beyond language. And that is the cogito's life with spiritual being as a relation beyond language, and that is where the self engages in the spiritual hearing of hupakuo that marks this moment. And Buber says there is, there is an innate feeling of being commanded at this level. There's a feeling of the uh, categorical imperative as a command. And the self creates, feels called to create the signs, the concepts here, to think system and to act in ethics. So signs, system, and ethics begin to evolve here in this conversation and the dialogue with others. Now, it is a, a reality that is beyond any conceptualization. And Buber says we have to take up the tangential gaze of the eternal you to perceive this, uh, this eternal you that... Uh, and closes all relationships and all dialogue. And so we have to take more or less a tangential view toward the situation and toward other selves in order to appropriate this, uh, this, this is, which is beyond finitude, this which uh, points beyond the logical possibilities to possibilities that lie in an anticipatory way. So the self takes up the tangential gaze, and every presentation by another self gives the individual a breath trace of the eternal you, which is compiled by the self in a, a stored region in the unconscious, which is the realm of the motivation. So the compiled traces begin to become compiled and gathered together and roughly synthesized into a form and but they're all stored in a latent kind of mechanical storage at first of these traces that uh, that have an inertia of their own to be organized into a form for the eternal you for the you that encloses all dialogical relations between selves So while we're here at this uh, conversation threshold, <clears throat> we are going to uh, recall the grace thought pictures. We are going to be engaged with other selves in discussing these grace thought pictures. And through our presentation and then 
acquiring the presentation of others, we began to uh, gather these trace, breath trace instances of the eternal you that encloses all dialogue. And we begin to compile these in our motivational base workspace in the unconscious. We begin to build up this uh, mechanical collective, a mechanical collective of uh, the traces of the other that uh, desire to be compiled into form. So we're not so much dealing with content here, but we are dealing more with form, a form which is informed by these uh, units of meaning that were interpreted as grace that now become gathered together in dialogue and begin to point to a more substantial and a more meaningful eternal you form that wants to be expressed in a articulated conceptual speech act that goes beyond this dialogical speech act of the, compos of the conversation threshold. So it desires to be articulated, conceptualized, and to move on beyond the mechanical workspace of these uh, trace elements that we have stored mechanically. So it is a relation of word. It is the key to Buber's position, uh, the key to his social ethics and the key to his social humanism is, of course, our continued reciprocal relationship to the conversation threshold and the discussion of the deeper meaning of the eternal you that is core to everything that he posits. And so it is the key moment, but that key moment is going to lead us to cognition and to the uh, conceptual articulation. Now we move on to conceptualization. It is going to be symbolized by the mercy seat, which was the gold cover on top of the Ark of the Covenant, the place of sacrifice, because the form that we gather together of the eternal you is the sacrifice upon which we will place our positing of the true representation of life, the positing of our true eschatological view for all existence, the Zoe life. So the speech act of the threshold is conceptualized and posited as altar, but the risk of the sacrifice of whole being is posited, even though it can't be firmly grasped or articulated in any finality. So we posit it as a coming to presence of, uh, rather than an already arrived. We posit it as a reciprocity between inventing and finding, formation and discovery, actualization and unveiling. And it is a positing of the Zoe life, the Soma body of life, symbolized in the blood of the mercy seat. So it's a positing of life model, of life trajectory, of life direction, and it's placed on top of the eternal you form that evolved at the conversation threshold that is uh, articulated as the altar. So the form becomes the altar of the content, which becomes a sacrifice. So form and content make up altar and sacrifice. The altar is the form of the eternal you. The sacrifice is the directional sense of Zoe life as a body organism, the entire organism of life that is moving forward. So the altar with its sacrifice are posited together, and this gives us the uh, transition moment to ethics when we will put this into play and the transition moment for Buber and for every individual who engage, engages in this existential quest is the existential self, the existential being, the uh, true subjective self, which is the existential self. And here he says it's going to be the, uh, the relation of election, he calls it, uh, which is uh, metaphorically represented as the tabernacle in the desert. Is a relation of election. Uh, we can never take up an ethics that uh, works with an objective it or a thing. We always uh, posit a praxis of encounter uh, within whole being as a new Zoe life. 
So there is no morphological correlate because that would mean that you could actually compile something into uh, a desired it, a predicate or an object. And Buber says that's impossible. We can't form our ethic into these objects or just simply predicates. It's a living presence and a li living dia dialectical involvement. So he, he does not propose a morphological correlate. So that's a big difference he has here with a lot of other people is that he doesn't believe in objectifying or turning into predicate even a, an individual's ethic. It has to be a living dialectical involvement of a true relation of praxis, a true interrelated relation of praxis. Now he does want to put that into play as uh, the metaphor of a new Jerusalem, which he calls a, a a humanism or a bodily humanism, a holistic humanism. That's his version of praxis. It's a relation of incarnation, of incarnating the eternal you of what he calls social humanity. Self gets involved in a social humanity. It involves a relation of aesthetics if you're dealing in the world of things. It involves a relation of love of your fellow selves when we re related to other individuals. It involves a relation of meditation in order to apprehend the world of mystery and spirit and in, in order to sustain that reciprocal relationship to the conversation threshold, which is never evacuated. So love becomes the cosmic force of change, the cosmic force of ethics. But uh, the hope out of this love does have to understand there's a, the practical element of a lamentation that always accompanies it that is always present in the desert. There is a, uh, a suffering because every you potentially can be deformed into an it. That happens when social humanity is permeated with contingent means, whenever humanity is reduced to just merely measure and boundary. We never can reduce our ethic to dealing with individuals that are so analyzed that become, they become measure and boundary, and then we articulate a morphological correlate. That is impossible for Buber. For Buber, it's always a living relationship, a living dialectical relationship that can never objectify other human beings. But our uh, social humanism is always a relation of incarnation, even through the negativity of uh, contingent means. We overcome our contingent means by continually positing a relation of incarnation and engaging in a true social humanity that takes up the I-U and continually negates the I-it of objectification. And so, of course, Buber is going to say that uh, the Logos cannot be identified as an objective metaphysical thing either. We can't say that Logos, the key to all of our understanding, cannot be um, a thing. It cannot be objectified. It cannot become a metaphysical object. Um, logos for Buber is nourishment. It's uh, the nourishment of enlightenment. The nourishment uh, as a force of enlightenment. It appears at the conversation threshold in the face of other the face of other individuals that we engage with dialogically. It's the force behind ethics. It's a lightning type or eruption type of uh, enlightenment. It's not causality. And it obtains an objective independence of its own. The, the metaphor, of course, is borrowed from ancient Israel of the manna that spiritually feeds the individual. And so... All we do at the sensate level is organize, organize experience into the units of meaning. But the eye of subjectivity is revealed in the encounter with other human beings that shows us the force of the Logos coupled with these units of meaning. So the force of the Logos is this manna of nourishment in relation. It's the manna in relation. And it is expressed by Buber in a triad. 
So again, he takes up the triad, and he begins with the I it, and this is uh, the unformed I U. So it still does the I U, but it's I unformed. The self splits the I from the U and engages in an I it relations with existence. Existence is posited as dualistic. The I becomes the carrier of merely sensations and units of the environment. It is a psyche that still needs to be realized beyond this stage of the sensate psyche. So as we mentioned before, that level of the psyche is the I-it. Now the second moment for Logos is the blossoming I-U. It's not the, uh, the realized I-U, but it is the blossoming I-U within cosmic being. And it's the recurrence of human becoming. It's the appearance of spirit that envelops all that is sensate. And it's uh, this positing of the idea of a blossoming paradise, which is also the idea of the IU of a true relational relationship with other selves. So it becomes the birth of the cogito through a dialogue of coaxing. When we get involved in this dialogue of sharing, these grace units of meaning, we coax the eternal you out of each other in this dialogue. It's a dialogue of coaxing, an exchange of awareness, and moments of a lightning type eruption. The eternal you begins to appear along with the realized I. There's a desire for reason. The eternal you and the realized I take on the idea of active being rather than an it object. So an object does not evolve at the second moment. Instead, the idea of a dynamic and living active being, the concept of being as a living organism emerges. It initiates the cogito's desire to be realized and the drive for conceptualization and synthesis of these ideas of the eternal you that emerge in conversation. So he takes us uh, from the I it the blossoming IU, and then three is going to be the realized IU. And the realized IU, the self actually become the IU. Always a process of differentiation and return, a differentiation into the self of the other and the presentation they make, and then a return back into our own understanding. The self uh, allows these memories of relation to appropriate the core in the U. The core of the U is posited as substance, the self creates a spatial temporal context as a background for this eternal you. And so the eternal you is posited as a you in process, a duration within the system of the unfolding event. And the IU, in fact, becomes equated with a process of event within the world. But uh, Buber says it can never be finalized as a world order. We don't posit a Weltanschauung world order. Instead, it's a force rather than a world order. It enters, it's a force that enters into creation and into sensate existence. So subjectivity and history become reciprocal, and each encounter in dialogue with other selves becomes a moment of the emergence of the sign of world order, the sign of that underlying eternal you form Every dialogue emerges into sign. Sign contributes to the workspace of forming the eternal you of form, which will later become what? The posited altar, which will contain the posited content or sacrifice. So the manna in relation is the I it passing through the conversation of the blossoming I you and onto the realized I you of the cogito. So it is all deeply entrenched in Judaic faith and is deeply entrenched in Judaic metaphor. But really what he articulates through his idea of concentrating on our relation with other selves who are existentially concerned and existentially centered, we will unfold this uh, nourishment of spirit that we are all potentially and latently present to and present within. But through dialogue, this nourishment of the Logos can emerge 
and it'll emerge by taking us out of the I it of possession and dominance, pass, passing us through the uh, dialogue with ourselves, where we can actually uh, begin to emerge with this uh, dialogue of coaxing the eternal you out of our dialogue. And through this uh, coaxing and this uh, basic uh, encouragement and uh, anticipatory attitude we take as we stand in at the conversation threshold, we can begin to move on to the realized IU that begins to grasp the spiritual, the beyond language aspect of what's going on in our conversation. And we start picking up the traces of the other. And the traces of the other initially become gathered just mechanically. But they have their own inherent self-actualizing ability to e eventually emerge into a, a form, an eternal you form that will make up that which we posit in a conceptualized manner. But along with that conceptualized form, we will want to uh, take the risk of positing the identity of the self, the identity of all selves, of the Zoe life as a whole, as a living organism, that it's on its way to its own directional sense of spirit. But the directional sense of spirit is a process. It is an event, and it is, it is an event that can never unfold in solitude, never unfold at the level of mere isolated psyche. We must become more than that. We must become conversational. We must enter into dialogue and exchange and differentiation. And then we can move on to the unfolding of the nourishment of the Logos. And that was from Martin Buber. He gave that, uh, he wrote this in 1923. Scribner's published it in English in 1970. But he actually wrote it in 1923. He did a little bit of revi revision, but very little, around 1965. Still the basic uh, document didn't change. And so the 1970 version really is the 1923 version. And that was about 10 years prior to Husserl and 40 years prior to uh, the emergence of postmodern thought. So quite a few years ahead of uh, everyone else in postmodern thinking. And that will wrap us up with uh, Martin Buber's I and Thou.